Osage Africa Middle East and we have Grant Paul, pre-sales engineer for X3 Africa Middle East, who will be running you through the session. PJ, over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you um, everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, a few items I'd just like to um, go through as an introduction from a SAGE perspective is um, SAGE's uh, vision and strategy around the markets and where we are going. Um, if you can just go to the next slide, please. And the next one. Thanks. So basically, um, just a quick a high level introduction from Sage before I hand over to our expert, Grant Paul. Um, the, the purpose for Sage is to transform the way people think and work so organizations can thrive, which Sage has been successful in many, many years in doing so. And with that, our vision is to transform and to ensure that we become a great SaaS company so our customers and colleagues alike can use the functionality of, of cloud products. Um, we have been successful at desktop and the cloud connected products. And now, obviously, there's a huge demand for, for our new um, and existing SaaS products. We see our business successes through three strategic lenses. One is through customer success. Successful customers are the currency of how well your business is doing. Happy customers, colleague success, happy colleagues. You know, you have a, have a happier ecosystem with customers. And then through innovation and through, through leading from the front in terms of um, ideas and new age um, uh, topics and um, inventions and so forth, Sage will be... Sage is leading in the innovation side, and obviously through these three lenses, we've kept it quite specific and concise to ensure that we have customer success at the end of the day. And then partner and customer success is led through uh, the, the success of um, our, our entire channel. So I think go to the next slide, please. Um, who do we serve within our channel? So we serve small and medium businesses, both normal businesses and nonprofit businesses. Um, uh, we're looking in the small side to automate accounting and smaller compliance items and managing costs and cash flow. This is typically your owner run or individual owner uh, businesses with professionals or small teams responsible for the finance and human resources function. So in that space, it's on the HR, or payroll or people side, as well as the accounting side. In the medium business and non-profits for the medium business, these are organizations that are scaling and becoming a bit bigger than the one-man businesses or owner-owned businesses, um, where there are functions uh, that are structured around these specialist teams and departments, such as your payroll and your accounting system and your ELP system. And then last but not least, our accountants. Uh, we believe the way accountants are moving to, to offer more um, cloud-based services and remote services and instead of transactional it will be more of an advisory base we have a huge accounting network and um, we are here to to ensure that we provide accountants of the future a way of uh, providing services to their customers to ensure their continuity and their relevance in this new way of work or this new world that we, we're going into and that's a high level overview of who we are at sage um, i know we don't have We've, we've got to close it too. However, I'm going to hand over straight to Grant Ball. We'll go through the manufacturing demo with you. Thank you. Grant, would you please share your screen? There we go. How's that? Yes, I can see. Wonderful. Wonderful. Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> Before we jump into our manufacturing demo, let's do a quick introduction to X3. So very firstly, I'm logged in as the super user right now, which means that at the, at the beginning of the, of the login session, we present with a login name and password. You'll notice on the top there's a web address. And I'm actually running off a web browser, meaning that Sage X3 is web native. Sage X3 is run from a web, web browser on the World Wide Web. So when we log in, our logins are linked to a specific role. And 
During the implementation, we identify what type of functionality the user in that role needs, and we create a user-specific dashboard for that particular person. Um, please, can you put yourself on mute? Um, so we've got tailor-made dashboards for the particular users. This is a good example of a visual process for manufacturing. Um, I would like to jump out of here um, and just show you what a tailored menu would look like for somebody who's got limited access. So as the super user, if I go through to the sales module, we can see a whole host of options. Somebody's not on mute. Please, can you mute yourself? And we've got a whole lot of sales options. We've got sales quotes, sales lists, sales orders, allocations, etc. When I log out of the super user and I log in as, as a sales representative who's got a, a tailored menu, what we'll notice is that there is very limited functionality that's been provided for this particular user to navigate through the system. So immediately you can see that all this user can do is process orders. So this is create the sales order. These are the inquiries related to the sales order, the reports related to the sales order. So everything that this user needs is sitting on one dashboard. And if we go back to the screen that I just showed you where I had for my sales module, we can see that on this particular user, all they have access to is sales orders from a sales module perspective. So this is an example of a tailored menu specifically for the sales role. Let's log out of the sales rep. Let's log back in as the super user. And just focusing on the, the architecture, the company structure of X3. So what X3 is is a single database system, meaning that all of the companies that you need in your organization that are operating in your organization are sitting inside of one database. Now these different three different segments you see here or what we call folders. So there's a development folder which we'll use, which is, which is a copy of the live folder. We'll use the development module to do custom developments. We create patches. In the, in the development module and deploy them into the testing folder and make sure that that patch actually works according to the way it was designed. And once we've tested that patch, we deploy it to live. And within the live folder, what we can see is multiple companies in different currencies with one or multiple branches linked to them. This means that we can run financials at the branch level as well as at the company level, but because all of the companies are sitting inside of one database, we can create a group of, a, uh, of companies. So we can link all of these subsidiaries to a single group and run our financials at group level um, within the ERP system without having to extract any financial information out of the system into an Excel spreadsheet, aggregate all the trial balances to, to get a set of consolidated results. All of that happens within the ERP. The fact that we can have all of the companies inside of one database means that we can do branch, company, and group reporting from Stage X3. We've got multi company, multi branch, multi language. There's multi legislation as well, meaning that should you branch out of your country, your continent, onto other continents, we've got different languages, different currencies, different statutory requirements, different legislations. And what Stage X3 delivers is 29 legislations out of the box which when a company is linked to that legislation code, it means that that company now has everything it needs to operate within that country, such as tax codes, um, document layouts, et cetera. Also a statutory chart of accounts, should there be one within that, com uh, that country. And then lastly, before we move on to manufacturing, Sage X3 has an analytical ledger, meaning that we know we're not maintaining a segmented chart of accounts, meaning that there's a concatenation of digits strung together to form perhaps the first six digits are the, the GL account code, the next three are the cost center, the next two are the division. So we're moving away from the, segment, uh, from the segmented ledger into a dimensional ledger, meaning that the, the account code is separate from the cost center and from the region, et cetera. So that means then that you may be moving from a very, very um, big, chart of accounts because you've got the same account for every combination of cost center and region or cost center and division. We'll move away from that to a very lean chart of accounts because all we need now is one GL account code for every type of transaction instead of a combination for every cost center and division. So multi single database, multi company, multi branch, multi language, 
multi-legislation, multi-currency, and then coming with a dimensional ledger. The story of our manufacturing demo today is that we're going to be manufacturing um, a batch of aluminium ingots. We're going to be doing this to satisfy demand that's coming from a customer order, as well as demand that's sitting inside of a production forecast. Now, what we can see here on our item master is a product code for the aluminium ingots. And what we can do is we can actually bring that, um, uh, we can add a, a picture to that. So perhaps if we have a picture for these aluminium ingots, we can add them in. Looking at the groupings over here, we've got different types of report groupings. We've got up to five report groupings for this particular product. So this is a non-ferrous metal, it's aluminium, and specifically it's an ingot. Meaning that if we ran the inventory report for aluminium, every type of aluminium product that we're seeing in group three will be included in the report. And if we run the report at group one, which is for non-ferrous metals, all types of aluminium and all types of um, aluminium products will be brought into that report. And if we're scrolling down a little bit further under the management section, we can see that we're managing this item. We can have non-managed items such as labor, consulting, but this particular item is lot tracked, so we're using lot management. And it's got detailed traceability, meaning that we are going to keep record of all of the lots of the raw, raw materials that are coming into this finished product. We know where we got those lots from, some of those which supplier supplied us with those raw material lots. And we also know the customer that we're selling the finished product lot to. So we've got detailed traceability upstream and downstream. If there's ever a product issue, we know which customers to do the recall of the product from and which suppliers to go and take um, corrective action against. Scrolling down a little bit further, we can see that if we had, if we needed serial management, we could enable it. If we're using pharmaceutical products, food and beverage, we've got expiry data we can control. Under the units of measure, we can generate stock labels. So this is for barcodes, for barcode scanning. So you can barcode scan at receipt, put away, stock take, picking, and all of that's managed through the barcodes that are generated from the label that we print out um, on receipt. We can see from the units of measure, we've got a stocking unit of measure, which is our the unit of measure that we value our inventory at. Now, we can also see that there's a purchasing unit of measure. And when the purchasing unit of measure differs, differs to the stocking unit of measure, we have a conversion factor. And we can see that here sitting with the sales unit. So we sell in tons, although we buy in kilograms and we stock in kilograms, but we sell in tons. And there's a conversion of 1,000 kilograms of the stocking unit of measure for one sales unit. Going through to the product site, which is where we link the product to a facility, so a production facility, manufacturing facility, or maybe a sales facility, or maybe a procurement facility. So in other words, in which facilities can this particular product move? So we're linking the product to, to, to a site, and within this product site record, we're able to define a different set of parameters that guide the usage of this particular product within this branch. So specifically, if we have a look at the counting mode, in this particular branch, we've set it to annual counts rather than cycle counts. And the stock withdrawal mode is specific to the components that are sitting in the bill of material for this product, in which case we set them to back flushing. So if we're going to be using the standard quantities of the components on the bill of material when we do our production tracking, the system will simply um, pull the raw material standard quantities that are seen in the bill of material out of stock when we produce this particular item. You can also see that this item's got a quality control uh, sheet tagged to it, meaning that when we manufacture this product, we're actually going to do a quality control test to check if we've got certain certifications, to check that our um, the, the, the elements that are in this product are actually working according to the way that they've been designed. So we're going to do something like a crack test um, we can do uh, alk alkaline tests, acidity tests on particular products. And that's all driven by the technical sheet that's attached to the particular product. Scrolling down a little bit further, what we can see over here is location management. So we can manage which bin locations, which racks, which warehouses, which facilities these products are allowed to flow through. And the container management over there is pallet tracking. So what we've got is something called license plate management, where in this case, these um, 20 tons of aluminum ingots is going to be stacked onto a pallet, meaning that we can put a barcode label on the pallet and move the pallet. And when we move the pallet, 
we're actually moving all the ingots as well. We can see the default stocking location for this pallet of ingots. We can see how much capacity or how many kilos of ingots this particular pallet can hold. We scroll down a little bit further, we can see if there's any expiry dates on this product. When do we, um, when is it marked as a, as a rejected item or when we have to do quality control check on it, just to check if it's within its, its lifespan still or whether it ex has expired. Down on the planning side, we can see our planning horizons. We've got some lead times. So in other words, we've got production lead times, quality control lead times, procurement lead times. And very importantly is the reordering mode. So in this particular example, we flag this product to suggest that we need to have this product in stock. It suggests that we make this product. So in other words, it's going to suggest a manufacturing order. We can see we've got safety stock, minimum stock, maximum stock, reorder thresholds. We can control those limits too. And when MRP runs, it takes these values into consideration before it determines how much to produce. So jumping to this particular product's bill of material. So we're manufacturing these aluminum ingots and we have raw material components that go into the manufacturer. So from the product master, if we just scroll down, we get to see the manufacturing bill of material that's linked to this particular product. So this product, we are we're controlling it by lots. It's a thousand kilograms or one ton, it makes up one lot. And these are the components that are then put into the manufacture of the aluminum ingots. We can see we've got scrap tin, scrap aluminum, and you'll see the last line is a byproduct, meaning that X3 manages byproducts as well. We can see the quantities of these components that go into the manufacture of our aluminum ingots. And then linked to this bill of material is a routing. In other words, what work centers does this product flow in order to come from a scrap metal to a aluminum ingot? If we scroll down a little bit further, we can see the time units, meaning that whatever times that we're entering in on this routing is in minutes and not in hours. So that means from an activity base, um, uh, activity um, ABC, so activity costing, we've got from a smelter, we're going to melt that raw material, all those um, scrap metals, and it's going to, we're going to set up, we're going to spend six minutes setting up the machine. It's going to run for 55 minutes. And it's running it on a thousand kilograms. And that's what we're going to be using, we're putting a thousand kilograms of our scrap into the furnace. We're going to be melting that. And then the next step is to actually pour that melted aluminium into molds to actually form the ingots. Now, linked to these operations are work centers. And behind the work center, what we can see there is the actual machine costs that are incurred when this machine is run. So sitting in the costing dimension, if we jump into the costing dimension on the right hand side for this particular machine, you'll see that it costs 55.6 dollars rands to run this per minute, 70 rand per minute for the setup time. And linked to this as well is the overhead. So this is your indirect production overhead recoveries. We can link those into the work center as well. And we can either have fixed values or we can use formulas to derive the values that are needed to recover those those indirect production overheads. So if we jump out of the costing dimension, let's go back to our routing. We scroll across a little bit more. And for each of these operations, what we can see as we go along here is we've got the run time. We've got the preparation time, wait time. All of these activities are incurring costs. And we need to factor those costs in when we're actually manufacturing this product so that we recover them and obviously make a profit. Now, we've got material costs, we've got labor costs, we've got machine costs, we've got overhead. We roll all of those costs up together to get the actual cost of manufacturing these aluminum ingots. In this case, it's a ton of aluminum ingots. So if we jump out of this product's bill of material and we go and have a look at the costing, again, we're just gonna be scrolling down the right-hand side. We're gonna select standard cost, and we can see that the standard cost of this aluminum ingot is made up of a couple of components. We've got the material cost, machine cost, labor cost, if there's any subcontracting, and there's the overhead recoveries. And all those add up together, give us our total cost to manufacture these aluminum ingots.
Now, just having a look at our product master, we can see that the product is linked to a category. And what we do in the category is we define all the parameters that control how this product gets used in the system. And when we link the product to the category, the product inherits all the parameters from the category. And then we're able to go and change them in the product if we needed to. But specifically what I want to show you over here is with regards to allocating the um, products on a FIFO basis to sales orders to work orders. So we can see the allocation rules for specifically for sales orders. In other words, when a customer orders a product, we want the system to allocate on a FIFO basis the oldest product, the first product that came in will be the first one that's coming out. And we define those rules within the product category. We can see as we're jumping into this particular product, we've defined it for FIFO, meaning that, and you'll see it a little bit later, when you generate our sales order, the system will use a FIFO allocation rule to allocate the oldest lot to that sale. Right. Let's go and have a look at our manufacturing process. So if we have a look on the visual process, you'll see I'm navigating through visual processes. It just makes the, the user's experience a lot more um, easier rather than navigating through a menu. Now, this example, we're starting with sales demand. The first demand is coming from a customer's order. And we can see here this particular customer is ordering 20 tons of our aluminum ingot. The other source of demand is coming from a forecast. So we have a production forecast in the system as well that says that in week three of this month, which is July, we expect to have sales or demand for a thousand or a ton. So what MRP is going to do when it runs, it's going to look at both sources of demand to determine how much final product to make and what raw materials we need in order to make that final product. So we run MRP, it's a, a very simple screen, but a lot of algorithms in the background are doing all the calculations. And the end result, we will see in what we call the enterprise planning workbench. So when we select the enterprise planning workbench and we hit the search button, we're able to see that MRP has done its calculations and it says, well, we've got a firm order. This is the customer order of um, 20 tons of aluminum ingots or 20,000 uh, kilograms. There's also a forecast for 1,000 kilograms. Therefore, MRP is suggesting that you create a work order for 21,000 kilograms or 21 tons of aluminum ingots. And in order to do that, we have material requirements for scrap tin and material requirements for aluminum. And the system suggesting, you'll see this uh, supply order suggestion, that we order that much kilograms of scrap tin and that much kilograms of scrap aluminum. Now, fortunately, with a lot of the automation capabilities that actually delivers, we are able to automatically generate the purchase orders for these particular suggestions. So if we click on the uh, grouping workbench, what the grouping workbench will do, will take all of the raw materials that are supplied by the same supplier and generate one purchase order for that supplier. If we scroll down here, what we'll see is that we've got two orders for two products, one's tin, one's aluminum, We've got the quantities that need to be ordered. If we scroll across a little bit further, we'll see that we've got two different suppliers here. That's because we are importing the scrap aluminum from a foreign supplier and we're locally procuring the tin from local sources. Now, what we can do in our grouping workbench is simply click the generate button and XG will automatically create those purchase orders. And with document management software, it will email those purchase orders to our suppliers automatically and electronically. What we can see here is the system has created two purchase orders, one for our foreign supplier, purchase order number 85, and one for our local supplier, purchase order number 86. Now our local supplier um, is, uh, is just for the one product, Chinese supplier is for the aluminum or for the tin. Let's go have a look at these now. So, the system has automatically generated those orders. And for our foreign um, supply, what we can do is we can use import tracking. So XG has import tracking capabilities, which means that we want to track the total landed cost of this particular product when we import it. So in other words, it must have the material cost plus all the logistics charges that have been added to it, such as transport, duties, insurance, et cetera. So what we do then, we jump into our procurement side and we actually link that foreign purchase order to a shipment. 
so that we can have those logistics charges predefined logistics charges attached to that shipment so that we can get the total landed cost of that particular product. So we jump into the shipment screen and we go and link that purchase order that MRP generated for us to our foreign supplier. Now on the left list is where we're able to go and select those outstanding orders that are specifically designed to be imported. So we're gonna go and specify our origin, which is China. The destination country is South Africa. We can see that we've got a purchase order linked to this. And when we create the shipment and we go to the costing section, what we'll notice is that there's the material cost and there is the logistics charges that have been added to it to give the total landed cost of the shipment. Now, if we go to the uh, nature, so we drill into this, we can see the three different logistics charges that are making up these costs. We've got pre-transport, main transport, and post-transport. We can also have insurance and duties and whatever logistics charges we're incurring listed over here. So the goods arrive, we can go do our shipment receipts to get our stock into our uh, production facility. So we're gonna go do a purchase order receipt into that site from our particular supplier. And down on the left list, the system has actually filtered those shipments that haven't yet been received. Now we can do partial receipts by selecting or deselecting the line. Um, and we can also do partial quantity receipts by changing the quantity. But you'll notice that I haven't, I haven't needed to type anything. So there's a lot of automation happening here in that whatever was on the purchase order and in the shipment is what's being brought into the receipt screen. And all I need to do is create that. This is just complaining about a lot number. So it wants the supplier's lot number, but we can proceed. What you can see, the system wants to generate uh, labels because we flagged the product master to generate labels. I'm not going to do that, so we're going to skip past this. And the other product we want to receive is our product from our local supplier. So let's go ahead. We'll see now on the left list again, it's going to filter all of those purchase orders that haven't yet been received. And there we go. That's our tin. So we're going to accept our tin order from our local supplier. We're not going to generate the labels. Now, XG is fully integrated system, meaning that all of the modules are linked together. So we've just done a purchase order receipt, meaning that if we go do a stock inquiry now, we should see that the stock is on hand. So let's do a search for scrap. Spell it right first, scrap. We can see there's scrap tin. Now, when we hit the search button, we can see that we've got stock in, but it's not available to pick. It's not available to use. And why is that? If we go have a look at our stock status inquiry, we'll see that is actually in quarantine, which means that the system's automatically created a quality control check for this. And that's because we flagged that on the product master. If we go have a look at our aluminium, so we do a search for our scrap aluminium, we can see that we have enough stock. So there's available uh, 25,000 kilograms. Now, with this inquiry here, we're actually looking at this stock in this production facility or in this warehouse. But if we clear the site, the system will show us all of the facilities that hold this particular product and show us what quantity on hand we have. We can see the quantity that's available for picking, what we actually have internally, what's been allocated or reserved in the sales order, what's being brought in on a purchase order or being manufactured, what's on loan, what's subcontracted. So we've sent this stock out to a subcontractor. There's also in transit stock. So if we're doing interbranch transfers. So this inquiry screen, Give us a lot of information of where our stock is at and how much stock we've got. So let's go do a quality control check on that, uh, on that uh, tin. So we're going to quality control and X3 again has done some automation. It's automatically created the quality control check for us. You can see if you just follow on the breadcrumbs in the top, you can see what screen I'm in. I'm actually going to do a quality control now on the uh, scrap tin that we've received. So let's go through, let's go open up the quality record. And we've got some questions. The first question is, has the raw material certificate been supplied? We say yes. And we've also done a vacuum test and we've determined what the value of that test was. And if it's outside of this acceptable range, X3 can automatically uh, fail this quality control check. But I'm gonna let it go through because we need these products. So let's go and enter this. We're gonna change the status of this product now. So 25,000 kilograms to status A, meaning that it's available to pick. In other words, we can put it through production now. So 
Going back to our stock inquiry, let's again just make sure that our stock is available. So that's for the tin. So we're going to do a scrap tin. And we can now see that the tin is available to use. So that now means we can start producing. So if we just follow our flow, we saw we had the demand. We ran MRP. From the enterprise planning workbench, we firmed or, or we, we generated the purchase orders. We're now about to firm up that suggested work order for the 21 tons of um, aluminium ingots. So let's go do that. We're going to do release. We're going to say take that suggested work order from MRP and firm it up. And that suggestion that MRP had was for the aluminium ingots. And we're going to take that suggested work order, firm it up, so it actually can automatically create a legitimate work order so we can start producing these aluminium ingots. And if we scroll down, we can see the work order number 43. So when we do our work order, we're going to generate all our documents, our picking slips to get our raw materials. We've got our job card so we know um, which work center that job needs to flow through. There's different types of options that we have for production tracking. But before we get there, let's have a look at the production scheduler. Now, the production schedule is a Gantt chart that highlights to us all of the work orders that are sitting on the job floor right now, broken down by the different work centers within the production facility. And what we're able to see is any bottlenecks. We're also able to see which work orders will be late, which orders work orders are about to be late, and they, they're the, the yellow ones. So the green ones, we're on time. The yellow ones, that if we don't start them soon, we're going to um, not be able to finish them on time. And the red ones mean that they're late already. And what we're able to do with the web scheduler is drag, drag and drop work orders to different work centers to alleviate bottlenecks. Um, perhaps you need to expedite some of the work orders so that we don't, that they're not late, which means we're going to miss our delivery date for our, our customer. So we can bring them forward and move them onto a different work center and have that other work center produce that particular product. So using our web scheduling GAN chart, we're able to identify bottlenecks. We're able to identify those work orders that will be late and then manage them so that we don't miss any work order deliveries or any sales or deliveries and that there's no bottlenecks on the production floor. From a production tracking perspective, we're able to have um, terminals at the work centers whereby the users can use barcode readers to scan the barcode and the job card, which will feed in the work order number. So if we just go, there's our aluminum ingots. We can see that it automatically brought up the product code. The user would then type in how many of those aluminum ingots were produced. We can see that it's going into a quality status, which means that we've flared quality control on this at the end of production. Um, I'm not going to carry on through here. I'm going to cancel out of here. We've also got shop floor control. In other words, we can track the actual time it takes to com complete a work order. Now, within shop floor control, what you'll see me doing over here, I'm scanning uh, as an employee, I'm scanning a barcode that's got my user credentials. Um, I could be using a fingerprint reader um, that identifies who I am. It shows the production facility. You'll see the clock in, clock out. So we can integrate X3 to a, a timekeeping system. Those clock in, clock out times are added through to our shop floor tracking. In other words, we know when the user came onto the floor. We know how long they've been working for, and we know how long it took them to work on certain work orders. Now, if we click on actual labor, we can see the work orders that have been assigned to this user, John Drake. And when we select that order, we can see set startup, set up start, which means that the user is now ready to do the startup for the machine. So maybe put water in the machine, maybe put some new drill bits on the machine. And once they've finished the start, they go and run this, the startup, they go and run the start. So what the system's actually doing it's keeping track of the exact time it takes to produce a specific work order. Now, those actual times can then be read um, back into the production tracking screen, which I'm about to show you. And this is the other alternative. If you prefer to have somebody in the back office capturing the production orders, so doing the feedback of production, this is where they would do it. Now, I'm going to go through and I'm going to select my product or, or my work order that I've been working on. There's the aluminum ingots. And if we run through, we can see that we've got operation tracking, production reporting, and material tracking. So operating, operation tracking is the actual labor work centers and the work centers that were used for the production. Production reporting is the amount of finished product that was produced and how much was rejected. And material tracking is how many components were used 
and uh, what, what wasn't used. Now, if we tab through the screen, we'll see all of those coming into play. So there's the work center that was meant to be used. Now, what work center was actually used? So in other words, if one of the machines broke down and we had to move the work order to another production uh, work center, we would enter that new production work center over there because that production work center has got its own machine costs. It might have its own overhead costs. We want to make sure that we're attracting the correct costs to our production to ensure that we've got the correct costs to produce so that we know what our margins are, so more accurate margin reporting. Linked to this uh, work center, again, let me show you. We've got the, um, the costing, which is the machine startup time, machine run times. We've also got the labor start times, run times. And if we're scrolling a little bit further, we can see how much product was actually produced. So if we only produced 20,000 kilograms, we change it to 20,000 kilograms. We, we've got the same for the other work center. Now, scrolling down, we can see how much aluminum ingots we actually produced. And notice the byproduct. The byproduct also coming through on this particular work order. And then down at the bottom is the raw material components. How much of those raw material components did we actually use? So if we go ahead and we save this, I'm just going to tab through here. What the system is going to be doing, it's going to be generating a lot number for this particular item because it is lot tracked. And let's save our production tracking. There's the labels. Again, we can print our labels. We're going to close out of the labels. Right. We've produced stock. So now what happens is if we go to our stock inquiry and we have a look at the aluminium ingots, how much should we have on hand now? What we can see there is nothing is available. Why? Because it's still sitting in quarantine, meaning that we haven't done the quality control check on the 21 tons of ingots that we've just produced. So let's go ahead and do the quality control check. We can see there it is. The system's automatically created that check. We go through, we enter our um, test results. So yes, we do have the certificate. Yes, our crack test was, was within range. And we're going to go ahead and pass this full 21 tons of aluminum ingots. Now you see the license plate coming. This is the pallet that those ingots are sitting on because we need to move those ingots to its dedicated put away location. So we're going to scan the label on the pallet. And that means we're going to move all 21 tons of ingots to the desired location that we can see as the default location. Quality control check has been done, which means that we should have those items available for picking. In other words, we can deliver them to the customer that's ordered them. Let's have a look. What we can see now, we've got on uh, allocated, so we've got internally 21 tons, but 20 thousand or, or 20 tons have been allocated to the order and we've got that remaining thousand kilograms waiting for somebody to order it remember this came from the production forecast um, before we go and actually ship those products what we can do is close the work order and this is where the um, work order calculations the production uh, calculations the costings are calculated so if we close that order it asks us, do we want to do production cost calculations? We say yes. And the end result of the production cost calculation will be how much it cost us to produce this particular product broken down by the different cost elements. Let's go have a look at that inside of the WIP cost inquiry. So what you can see, if we just uh, go over here, let's say this was for today. Our actual and expected rejected and variance costs coming through for those different cost elements for that particular production. And to close off this um, whole process would be the actual shipping of those ingots through to our customer. So if we go back to our sales order, 
and we have a look if this is the one for our ingots. It's number 15. You can see our ingots. If we go have a look at the allocation, what we should have or what we should see is that the system's automatically allocated that batch of ingots to this order because this was the order that was the source of demand to manufacture those ingots. So it just makes sense to have the system automatically allocate those ingots back to this order. And that's exactly what it's done. And what you can see that it's done, it's used detailed allocation, which means that it's allocated it by lot number. So if we go look at this allocation rule, we can see that it's allocated 20,000 kilograms of the particulate that we've just produced to that order. And it's coming out of the location that we saw where we're gonna do the pallet put away. So we're ready to deliver these goods from the sales order. We're going to fire up the delivery. We're going to pick up that pallet of aluminium ingots. We're going to put it in the truck. So we're validating. We're going to generate the invoice for this particular delivery. And the aluminium ingots should be out the door now. We're going to post this invoice. So it's generated the invoice. We're going to post this invoice. We're going to send the invoice off to the client. And uh, from a stock perspective, we should see now, if we go do a stock inquiry, that there's only a thousand aluminium ingots left in stock because we've just delivered the other 20,000 that was manufactured from the source of demand. So let's have a look at the aluminium ingots and do a search. And there we go. We've only got a thousand left in stock. And that brings to the end of my manufacturing demo. We can open the floor to question now. Before we go there, let's just have a look at the um, Sage Enterprise Planning um, reporting that we can use for production tracking. So what we can see here from SEI, which is the BI reporting tool for X3, is dashboard specifically catered for manufacturing. But it's not just manufacturing. Because it's a full ERP system, we've got dashboards for creditors, for procurement, cash flow, debtors, fixed assets, financials, and sales. And obviously, that's because Sage X3 is a fully integrated system, and all of those modules, or all of those disciplines that I've just mentioned to you are available as standard modules um, that are shipped with Sage X3. Thank you. We can open the floor to questions. Thank you again, um, Grant, for a, um, a great presentation there, and really just giving everyone a practical view of um, the product and really just giving us an opportunity to be able to see it in action. So not just from a presentation deck perspective, but really getting an opportunity for the customers to be able to see the presentation itself. Um, Bindia, do you want to take on from me? I see that Bindia has been having some struggles. I don't know if she's back online. <laughs> 